Hi to YouTube. In the last video, I showed you how to set up a particle photon, which is an internet connected variant of an Arduino that you can pick up for 19 bucks. And we didn't do that just for fun. We're going to use that photon to control these individually addressable RGB LEDs, in this case, turned into a Christmas wreath. These are what is known as addressable RGB LEDs. What the heck does that mean? Well, addressable means that no matter how many are on the string, and I just have a little cutoff here, it's got 10 of them on there, but we can, using the Photon or pretty much any other computer, talk to any one of these LEDs individually, sort of regardless of the length of the string, within reason. What do we tell it when we talk to it? Well, basically what we give it is a red, a green, and a blue value that tells it how bright to come on and what color. So there's going to be two parts to this. The first part is going to be assembly of the wreath itself, and then we're going to have to head over to the computer and figure out how the heck we get that photon to do all the cool stuff we want it to do with these LEDs. The only hard part of this is getting the wire untwisted so they'll lay flat. You can then wire tie each bulb into place on the wreath frame. Okay, after a couple of hundred zip ties and several hand cramps, you're going to end up with something that looks a little bit like, <laughs> like this. Um, this is a mess. These LEDs are, uh, are kind of sticking all over the place, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, by the time we get this covered with some garland or something, they'll, they'll fly right and uh, get into formation, what have you. The only two things that are important about this are that you get each row of LEDs kind of going up and down or left and right, depending on where you are on the frame, as close to lined up as, as possible. You don't, you don't want them zigzagged all over the place in some random fashion. You probably want to start on the outside of the frame and stretch the LEDs as tightly as you can, get them as far apart as possible around the outside perimeter uh, because you can then push them closer together easily enough as you move in. And also, absolutely positively, make sure you get an even number of LEDs the whole way around the thing, because you want the top and the bottom and the left and the right to have uh, matching pairs. Uh, and then also, you'll see when we get to the code, when you're trying to figure out the math to light up you know, this LED or that one or that row or whatever, um, having an even number of LEDs keeps everything pretty straightforward. Uh, if you have an odd number of, of rows or lines or whatever going around here, um, it becomes a real pain in the butt to figure out how to turn the right one on. This is three wire 18 gauge thermostat cable that I have to make all the connections with. It's readily available at the home center. 500 feet of it is dirt cheap, but it has a couple of drawbacks. One, the conductors are solid and they're small, so they are prone to breaking even inside the case. You're going to have to be a little bit careful when you bend this, uh, especially when you're installing the wreath wherever it's going to go. Uh, this stuff is also not rated for outdoor use, so if you're going to put the wreath outside, which you can, the LEDs themselves are IP66 waterproof, um, you're just going to have to keep an eye on this stuff. You may end up replacing it every couple of years. Wiring up the wreath starts by cutting the extra LEDs off the end of the strand, then using a good quality wire stripper, or the one I have, to expose some bare copper. All the connections have to be soldered and then covered in tape and heat shrink tubing if you want this thing to be waterproof and able to stand up to the outdoors. However, with this stiff wire, sometimes getting those things to hold together while you solder them is not easy. I'm going to come over here and plug this thing into my little microcontroller board. That's one of the few nice things about this thermostat wire is it actually just plugs directly into these breadboards. So that's it for the physical construction part of this. Uh, it's not really that complicated. You wind the strings of lights around the thing and you tie them down and you stretch your three wires out to your breadboard. Um, it's tedious, it's time consuming, uh, but with a little bit of patience, anybody can knock this part out. The fun comes that now we have to go back to the development environment for our photon and figure out how the heck do you make addressable LED lights work? Every time I do one of these Arduino projects, I get feedback from a lot of you that say, hey, that's really interesting, but wow, I could just never, never do that. I could never write all of that code. And the reality is, I don't write a lot of code. I firmly believe in the expression that plagiarism is the sincerest form of flattery. And in the world of Arduinos, pretty much there's no wheel that hasn't already been invented. No matter what you want to do, somebody's already done it, and the odds are there's code out there that you can just copy, maybe tweak a little bit to suit your purposes. 
So I've created a blank application called LED testing for the purposes of just playing around with these lights and figuring out how to get them to work. But I am not making the assumption that I have to write all of the code to do this. In fact, quite the opposite. I'm assuming that there's a library out there somewhere that allows me to do most of what needs to be done without having to write it myself. And so the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and click on the libraries tab, come down here to the search box and type in LED. Scrolling down a little bit, sure enough, there are tons of LED libraries to do different things with different LEDs. The one that we want to control these individually addressable RGB LEDs is the second one in the search result, the Fast LED Library. I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom and click on Include in App and pick my LED testing application. This tells the build environment that I want all of the stuff that's in that Fast LED Library to be part of the program that I'm writing. I'm going to grab something else out of this fast LED library. Almost all of these things have an assortment of example programs included with them. You can identify them easily enough. They have the .ino for Arduino program extension on them. In the case of fast LED, firstlight.ino is the simplest, basic, super commented program that just shows you how to get going, how to make a light come on on your string of LEDs. So I'm going to select it from the list. Do a control A and a control C to copy everything. Scroll down and go back to my app and replace what was there with everything from the sample program. The comments are pretty self-explanatory and quite honestly, there is a lot in this fast LED library. I'm not going to go through all the features and functions of this thing because quite frankly, it would be a whole channel unto itself. For our purposes, there are only a couple of two or three things that we really need to look at to make this example work for what we actually built over on the table. The first is here on line 16, where we have a constant defined, the number of LEDs that we're working with. In the example program, that number is set to 60, but our wreath actually has 140 LEDs in sequence, so I'm going to change that number. Line 19 defines which pin on the photon we actually connected the data wire from the LEDs to. You can take your pick. You can either connect your LEDs to pin 3, or you can change the example program to the pin you used, which is what I'm going to do because I used pin 5. Line 25 is the most important and probably the hardest to understand in the whole program. This is where we define an array. An array is just a list that all goes under the same name, but has an index. In our case, it runs from 0 up to 140, which is our number of LEDs. And what this array represents is a little space in memory, one space for each LED in our string. The setup routine, which remember this is what only executes one time when the chip powers up, has the usual two second delay in case anything goes horribly wrong, and then comes down here and executes one of these lines. Now I uncommented the one that has this WS2811 parameter right here in the middle, but there are a whole bunch of different flavors of this same line. What these are, are, they correspond to the different types of chip that could be embedded in your LEDs. You'll know when you buy them which one of these chips your LEDs come with. Scrolling on down here to the loop function, which executes over and over again, according to the comments, this is where the magic happens. It's really not magic. All this loop does is run one big for loop. Remember, a for loop is going to start at some number, it's going to end at some number, and it's going to count either up or down, usually by one, although you can control that. In the example program, they've declared a variable called white LED that's going to be the counter. What does the counter do? Well, it starts at zero. It runs as long as the counter is less than the number of LEDs. Remember, all these things in the C programming language kind of start at zero and go to one less than what you really have. And then each time we run through the loop, we're going to increment the value of our LED counter by one. What do we do once the counter is established? Well, this is where we use the magic of that array that now corresponds to our LEDs. We call the LEDs array and we pass it an index that tells us what LED we want to do something with. What are we doing? Well, in this case, we're just setting it to white. Line 65 tells the fast LED library, hey, take the array of data that we have over in this, these LEDs. It now has a value for every LED. And in our case, right now, that means one of them is white and all the rest of them are still off. And send it out. Send it down the wire. Light up all the LEDs in that string with whatever color and brightness they're supposed to be. We then wait 100 milliseconds, one-tenth of a second, and we turn that same LED off, otherwise known as set its color to black. 
but let's go ahead, compile this, flash it down to the uh, photon, and I'll show you what it looks like on the wreath. And so here's what the program looks like running on the LEDs attached to the wreath. Essentially, we told it to light up one LED and then turn that one off and light up the next one. So since we wound the LEDs in a big circle around the wreath, it kind of looks like they're chasing around in circles. It's really just LED 0, then LED 1, then LED 2, all the way up to LED 139. And when it gets to the end, it goes back and it does LED 0 again. You can see that here as it jumps from the outside to the inside of the wreath. Now, odds are to do something really interesting, you're going to want to turn more than one LED at a time on. So let me flip over to the program I've got going for the wreath and show you a couple of the functions I've built to start making this thing dance. But I wanted to run you through just one of these and show you kind of how this works when you want to deal with more than one LED at a time. The trick is you set all the values in that array to what you want a particular show to do, and then you show all the LEDs at one time. For instance, I have five circles of LED on the wreath, the inner ring working out to the outer ring. They all have 28 LEDs in the circle. So I can create a function to say, well, I want to light up any one of those circles that I can just tell it, hey, go light up circle number three. Oh, and by the way, set it to this color and to this brightness. So the trick to this is figuring out which LEDs are part of each one of these circles. There are 28 LEDs in each circle. So we know that the innermost circle of LEDs starts at LED number zero and goes up to LED number 27. The second circle of lights starts at LED number 28 and goes up from there and so on and for so forth. That means I can come down here and I can sort of mathematically compute my start and end point for any given circle, starting with circle 0, the innermost, circle 1, 2, 3, and 4. Remember, everything is zero based in this language. It's then a simple matter of running through another one of these four loops that starts at my starting LED number, ends at the ending LED number, increments by one, and sets all of those LEDs to the correct color. I have a similar philosophy going on here in a different function called light line. This means I want to light up one of those sets of five LEDs that's in some clock position around the, the 28 on the wreath. I started with that first LED, LED number zero. The line that it's in, I'm going to call line zero. And because each one of my trips around the wreath has 28 LEDs, I know that it's neighbor to the outside of the wreath is 28 indices higher in the array of LEDs. And so my first LED, I just light up directly based on which line I told the function I want to light up. And then I go through and I do the same thing to find its four neighbors. I add 28 to the index I'm using into my array and light up that LED. Add another 28, light up the next LED, and so on and so forth until I've lit up all five neighboring LEDs out the row. Now, I really don't want to bore you to death with a big, long code walkthrough. I want you to just take basic principles away from this. One of those principles is that you do your animation in pieces. I wrote a couple of functions that light up what I call primitive sections of the lights. A line, a circle, a block, something like that. Then, to do my animations, I don't work directly with the LED array. I work with those basic light up some part of it functions. Here's a good example. This chasing lines routine takes one of those lines and just animates it the whole way around the wreath. You can see it over here in the corner, what it looks like. I don't work directly with the LED array for that. I work with the function that I wrote that lights up one line. I iterate through all 28 of the lines on my wreath. Remember, I had 28 LEDs in each circle, so that gives me 28 of those lines. I light up that line with whatever my current color is. I tell the fast LED library to go ahead and push all my changes out to the LEDs. I wait just 25 milliseconds, and then I go back and I do the next line. Okay, I know, I know, it's a pile of code. You guys hate code. I'm kind of with you. I'd much rather build stuff with my hands than sit in front of that damned computer and type all day. But the reality is there is something addictive about being able to bring the stuff that you build to life. And this coding business is not something you have to know going in. You can start very, very basic by copying an example, changing one or two things to get it to work on your setup, and build on it from there. Once you get a couple of basic concepts in your head and learn a couple of idiosyncrasies of the syntax of the language, you'll find out that this stuff really isn't that hard. I'm going to run down to the dollar store and see if I can't get some garland and tinsel and stuff to turn this mess of wires into a wreath.
In the meantime, if you have questions or comments, leave them down below. Maybe think about hitting that subscribe button while you're out there. I'm going to leave you with uh, some of the patterns and designs that I came up with for the animation of this wreath. And while you're watching it, stay safe, YouTube.